today, the theme, if you've uh, noticed throughout the music and everything that we've done, is that there is a light. And in fact, that's the title of today's message is There is a Light. We're going to get into the Word of the Lord. And you know, when we come to church on a weekend, especially like this, you know, sometimes people want to come and they want to see the song and dance, they want to hear the preacher, and, and, and they want to just kind of do the religious thing. But you know what? God is not into religion. God's into the hearts of people. And I can't preach good enough, loud enough, I can't spit enough or have veins popping out of my neck or sweat enough to get the Word of God into your heart. That happens when we have open hearts towards the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. Not a man, not a woman, not the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color, anything that we could imagine. No, this is about us coming together and hearing from God. The Holy Spirit is the real teacher of the church. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and to speak to each and every one of us today. If you have your Bibles, get a hold of your Bibles. I'm going to get down on my knees. And if you have the ability, come on, you're going to be sitting for a while. Stand up to your feet, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, we come to you this Easter weekend, God, celebrating the resurrection of our King Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful that we can come into your house, lift our hearts and our hands and praise you and thank you for all that you've done, God. You are good, Lord. Your love endures forever. God, we're so grateful that Jesus isn't dead. Surely he's alive and he's seated at your right hand, even now, God, interceding on our behalf. Lord, we thank you for all that you are, all that you've done, God, and Lord, all that you will do in our hearts and lives. Today, God, as we open up your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Truly today, God, we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, God. We came to hear from your Holy Spirit. So welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord, and we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we want to leave different than we when we came in, God. Lord, we ask that you would open the eyes of our understanding and illuminate our hearts today. May the word of God just light up our life. And God, we give you the praise and the glory for it. God, also, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, there are brothers and sisters, and we don't think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we ask that you bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels, God. We thank you for Harvest, for Oak Valley, for Ecclesia, for the Way, God, Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, God, for Victory and Crossroads, God, all of the assemblies and four square denominations, God, for uh, the, the Catholic brothers and sisters, Lord, and Adventist brothers and sisters, God, if they're preaching your gospel, lifting up your name, preaching your truth, God, we bless them as you would bless us. God, also, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the earth, Lord. We ask that you would cover them, protect them, encourage them, equip them, deliver them, Lord, from the hand of their enemies, God. We pray that they would never give up, never renounce your name, Lord, that they would endure to the end, God. And Father, we thank you that you are faithful. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. Amen. You can have a seat today. I just want to take a moment, this is the third service, and we have had quite a day already and quite a week already, and I just want to say thank you to all the volunteers and all of the staff, everybody who put time and effort into what you just experienced right now. Love you guys so much, and thank you for your efforts, and just appreciate you guys. You guys got your Bibles? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. We're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. As you turn there, I want to just tell you a story. It's a very familiar story, probably a story that you know. It's the story of light and dark. We know that God is light. The Bible describes him as such. In God, there is no darkness. God created heaven and God was preexistent. God existed before time began. That's kind of hard for us to understand because we exist in time. And this is something that's outside of our natural understanding. But God always existed and God is the light. God created heaven, and God created the angelic beings that were with him. And there was a point in eternity that one of the angels, we know him as Lucifer or also as Satan, who decided to exalt himself above God, apart from God. And in a perfect environment, in perfect conditions, sin was birthed in the heart of the devil. Iniquity was found in him. The Bible says he was lifted up in pride, and he said those famous five I wills that you'll find in the Bible, I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. It continues on. 
And there, Jesus describes the moment where he saw Satan cast out of heaven like lightning. And you know, it goes on, God created the heavens and the earth, and and God filled the earth, God formed and fashioned the earth, God outfitted the earth. He had plants, he had animals, he had ecosystems, he had all sorts of stuff going on. He had the solar systems, all working together to keep us in the perfect environment in perfect conditions. God placed man, the crown of his creation, on the earth, and he set man in the garden, and he gave him a job, and he brought to him a helper, the woman, right? And he brings these two together, and he gives them dominion over the animals and over the land and over the creation. And it was in this perfect environment, in perfect conditions, that once again, the devil steps in, and the devil deceives Eve, and she breaks the commandment of God. She takes from the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, and she eats it. Now, the Bible records that she gave to her husband who was with her. So Adam wasn't deceived. Adam entered willingly into rebellion against God. And now, passing on from generation to generation, all of us have that same condition on the inside of us. At one point or another, we've rebelled. At one point or another, we've sinned. Maybe we didn't sin like Adam did, but we still sinned. We still messed up. And the Bible says that at that moment that Adam sinned, that he gave up his dominion. See, the devil usurped the authority of God and, and went and took the one who had dominion, and Adam handed over the keys of the dominion of earth to the devil. That's why the Bible describes the devil as the God, lowercase g, small g, of this age. The devil is ruling the systems of this earth because he has the dominion because Adam handed it over to him. But God couldn't stand to leave us in that condition. God did not want us to stay. See, when when Adam sinned, the Bible says that God told him, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, Adam didn't fall over dead when he ate that fruit, right? You can read in the Bible, he continued to live on for hundreds of years. But what happened was, was spiritually, Adam was now separated from God, he was out of the light, and now Adam was in darkness. So God saw us in this condition and knew that we could not save ourselves. Why? Because a dead man can't save himself, right? Dead man, all he can do is just sit there and do nothing. So here we were in the darkness, and now God sends his son. He breaks forth from his side, his son Jesus, and he sends him to the earth, and Jesus comes and he proclaims, I am the light of the world. Jesus lives the perfect, spotless, sinless life. And yet, the leaders of that time, the religious rulers of the age, They didn't recognize him or know him. Judas, one of his own, inspired by the devil, filled with Satan himself. Once again, Satan comes and he's looking for an opportune time to quench the light, to put out the light. And and Judas goes and he betrays Jesus. And Jesus is handed over to the religious leaders of the day. And there he's beaten and and, and he's taken through uh, unlawful trials throughout the nighttime. Finally, he's handed over to be crucified. The Bible says the rulers of the age at that time, if they would have known, they would not have crucified him. And yet here's the king of glory, the light of the world, hanging on a cross. And on that Friday, Jesus gave up his life and died. And he tasted death, the Bible says, for all of us. You know what happened when Jesus died? His darkness covered the land. Isn't that amazing? Before Jesus had died, he cried out and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did he say that? Because for the first time, Jesus was separated from God. He'd never experienced the break in fellowship, never experienced what real death was all about. Death is separation from God. See, God is the light and therefore Jesus tasted that darkness. He experienced death on our behalf. He took the punishment and the pain and the weight and the consequence of sin upon himself on the cross. And that's why when God turned his face from him, the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus on that cross, and he became the substitute for our sins. They buried him in a grave, and there he lay from Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning. The Bible says that early in the morning when the first light of dawn had come, early in the morning, that there were disciples and there were women who came to the tomb to see where Jesus lay. In fact, Mary was coming because she, she was going to go and continue the, the burial preparations, wrapping him in ointment and spices and all those sorts of things. And yet when she encountered an angel, he says, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Like he said, go and tell the disciples and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. 
See, death and sin and the devil and the darkness could not stop the light of God from shining on Easter morning, could not stop the light of God on that resurrection Sunday morning. Jesus now shines the light. Now, we know this story, right? And yet when we look around and when we maybe watch the news reports, it seems like things are getting darker and darker around us. And maybe you're like me. You know, I have questions. I have concerns. I wonder about those things. Sometimes I watch the news and I say, God, what's going on? God, what's taking place? God, I just don't understand. I don't see how this works. You know, we've all had questions. Maybe you had a a horrible upbringing. Things happened to you while you were growing up that should never happen to anyone. And there you were wondering, God, where are you? God, why? Why all this darkness, God? If Jesus is risen, if he's powerful, if he's on the throne, if he's overcome, then God, why am I still in this painful place? The Bible records in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You guys turn there. You remember I told you to turn there, right? All right, praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting verse number 3. I didn't forget about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting verse number 3 says, But even if our gospel is veiled, see, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4, whose minds, the God of this age, that's the lowercase g, God of this age, that's the devil, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. See, the devil is at work. He is alive and well, my friends. And if the devil could get us to believe that he doesn't exist, he's happy. Because he can go on deceiving, he can go on stealing, he can go on killing, he can go on destroying, doing his work unhindered because we think, you know, oh, there is no devil. I don't believe in that spiritual hubba lub, you know, that's not real. And yet the Bible records the devil is real, the devil is at work. That's why when you see the darkness around, you can know that the devil is at work doing things on the earth today. And he is trying to veil the hearts of people, he's trying to stop the light from shining on the hearts. Now look at what it goes on to say, verse number five, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sakes. Verse number six, look at what it says. It says, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. See, this is the same God of creation. This is the same God who said light be and light was. This is the same God in heaven who sent his son for us. It is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, when you look at Jesus, and when you see the resurrection light that shines from him, now all of a sudden you start to understand. Now all of a sudden you start to realize, I I can see what's going on on the earth. Now you start to understand, I understand now why my past was the way it was and what God was doing and how God kept me and how God, I should have been dead. I should have been left on the street. I should have been in the prisons. I should have been out and, and yet God saved me and God gave me the light and God took me through it all and God is good. See, when you look in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, now you get the light. Today, I want to just take you through a couple of things. And as we go through these things, I believe God's going to answer some questions in this place. Some of you guys came to this place. You've been coming to church for a long time. Some of you guys have not been in church in a long time. And you've had questions and you've wanted, and and maybe you came into this place today and I believe you said this on your way and you said, God, I need to hear from you. God, if you're real, I, I need you to speak a word to me. Today, God is calling you out right now. God has read your mail. God was in the car and heard the conversation on the way here. And God's gonna answer those questions as you get a hold of the light today. Can you say amen? Today, I wanna just tell you a couple things what the resurrection light brings. See, as we look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we see the light that's shown on that resurrection morning. It brings some things. First thing, what the resurrection light brings is this. It brings clarity. It brings clarity. Jesus brings clarity to life, just like light brings clarity to the darkness. You ever been walking around in the middle of the night? You know, you up in the middle of the night need to get a drink of water, right? And, and really, it's just an excuse to go get a midnight snack, right? Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Don't say amen. It's okay. 
get up in the middle of the night, and you don't want to wake anybody up, of course. You're not going to be rude, so you want the kids to stay asleep, and you want your wife or your husband to stay. So you're tiptoeing around the house, and you're going throughout, and you don't even want to flip on any lights. You don't want to hear that click, and you don't want the light to wake anybody up, right? So you're walking around in the darkness, and you know what happens. You, as you're walking by the end table, you hit your little baby <laughs> pinky toe. And what do you do? Wham! See, you're not yelling anything because you, can't, you, don't, you still don't want to wake anybody up because you're still going to go get that snack afterwards, right? <laughs> and you're hoping it's not broke, right? And so you're hobbling over to the kitchen so that you can open up the refrigerator door and take a look and see if it's black and blue. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. See, if you would have just flipped on the light, would you have hit that end table? No, why? Because now you have clarity. Now you can see the obstacles. It's the same way with the resurrection light. See, we were kind of just groping about in darkness. Didn't really know what was going on, bumping into things. Kind of hoping that we'd bump into something good. And yet God brings the light. And when you live your life in the light of the resurrection... When you live your life according to the light of God's word, now all of a sudden it brings clarity to life. It answers those questions. You realize that God is good. You realize his purposes. You realize the plan of God for your life. You realize the goodness of God surrounding you. In fact, Jesus himself declares himself to be the light. In John chapter 8, if you want to turn there with me, we'll be in the gospel of John, big John. John chapter number 8. Jesus is speaking in verse number 12, and he says this, and Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to walk around in the dark. I don't want to be bumping into stuff. I want to have the light. I want to be able to see. I want to be able to know what I'm up against. I want to be able to see the obstacles and the pitfalls. See, the devil will continually try and and put a shroud over that light. He wants to cover it up and keep you blind and keep you in darkness. He wants to put God in a bad light. You you ever use those terms, right? We we know what that's all about, a bad light, right? We we talk about, well, don't put it in a bad light. Don't speak evil of it. Don't say anything, right? Maybe you went down to the ring store, right? You were going to buy a diamond ring. And there in the, in the ring store, they got every kind of little light shining on. And so that when you put it on, you see the little bling bling in the ring ring. And, and, and you really like it, right? And, and you say, okay, it's, I, I love it. I'll take it. And so you purchase that ring. And what happens? You walk out into the real light, the sunlight. And you take a look in the sunlight because you're thinking, man, if, if that's how it looked in the store, when I get outside and you go, oh, when did it turn yellow? <laughs> see, they had bad light. They were fooling you. Well, what about this? Let me speak to the ladies for a second. You're there down at the store, right? You're going to buy a new shirt, going to buy a new pair of pants, and you get in the dressing room. Mm Mm-hmm. You can't see a thing in that dressing room. They keep it all dark and cloudy, right? And so you're going, I think it looks okay. I I really don't know, right? Does does it make me look big, right? What what about this side, you know? You're asking your girlfriend or your husband. and, and, And finally you say, I think it's okay. And so you purchase it, and then you get it home. And you get it there in your closet, and you try it that same thing on that looked okay at the store, and you go, what was I thinking? See, it's bad light. God's saying, I don't want you to walk around in the bad light that the enemy's trying to portray. See, the Bible says that the devil portrays himself as an angel of light. But that's a bad light. The devil's going to tell you it's okay. You don't need church. You don't need Jesus. All this stuff is radical. It's too much. I I don't really like that kind of a thing. And yet, Jesus is saying, I want you to walk in the light. I want you to to go after me. See, you don't have to grope about any longer. You don't have to wonder about God any longer. Now you can come into that light. In fact, the book of Acts talks about this in chapter number 17. I'm going to read it to you in the message paraphrase. Okay? In the message paraphrase, uh, a guy was writing for his children to have an understanding of what the Word of God is saying. So he changed some of the words and made it more contemporary language. Now, listen, we're all God's children. We all need to understand the words. So, Acts chapter 17, verse 27, 28, in the message says this It says, starting from scratch, speaking of God, he made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living. So we could seek after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. He doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. We live and move in him. Can't get away from him. See, 
God wants you to come into the light so that you can see, so that you can have clarity. But not only that, God wants you to come into the light and, and take a look. And what does the resurrection light bring? Well, number one, it brings clarity. Number two, it brings warmth. The resurrection light brings warmth. You can imagine the disciples on Saturday. Here they are, they've had high hopes. Here they are, they've, they've gone and they've done great and mighty wonderful things. They've seen people raised from the dead. They've seen demons come out of people with screeches. They, they've seen the miraculous, people who were lame for decades now leaping and walking. They, they've seen all sorts of things. They've seen the crowds. They've heard the, the, the wisdom that comes. And then on Friday, what happens? This one who they put all their hopes in, this one who they declared to be the Messiah, this one is the one that's hanging on a cross in between two thieves. You can imagine the disappointment. You can imagine the questions that came up in their minds. They're wondering, did I just waste three years of my life for this? Maybe God's going to send another. Maybe we were wrong. You can imagine the cold feeling. Some of you guys have felt that cold and alone. Doesn't matter the temperature, on the inside you just felt, my goodness, felt like shivering, felt like just darkness. And yet, when Sunday morning came, I believe that's why John and Peter jumped up and they ran to the tomb, is because now the resurrection light had shone on their hearts and they felt the warmth for the very first time and they decided that they were going to go and they were going to run and they were going to warm up to that light. This morning we were out in the courtyard and we were out there having a sunrise service and we were all shivering, all cold and everything. And I was grabbing my kids, you want to come sit in daddy's lap? Why? Because they're like a hot water bottle. I want to, the body heat, come on, warm daddy up, you know? And so we're all covered up in blankets and everything. But as the service went on, the sun started to rise over the buildings and that light hit our faces and that light covered our bodies and went down to our legs and down to our toes and it just warmed us up. See, the resurrection light of Jesus Christ, now, as, as you start to view that light, as you start to get into that light, it will take you and it will warm you up. We can't let our love grow cold. We can't allow ourselves to be calloused towards the things of God. The same light that hardened Pharaoh's heart is the same light that melted Saul and turned him into Paul, the apostle. See, what matters is what you're made of. See, sometimes people get into a church service and that light hits them and, and they start to grow cold and they start to harden up. Why? Because of what they're made of. See, you could come into a church service like this today and say, well, I don't really like what's going on over there at the rock. You know, they got too many lights. They've got too much smoke. Why do they even need that? That's got to be unholy. That's got to be ungodly. You know, all that sound is way too loud. What are they trying to do? Break someone's eardrums? Then you got this old guy that's talking about falling asleep on the couch. And then the young guy's coming in here with his skinny jeans and, and his weird hairdo and all that kind of stuff. I don't even know if I like that church. But listen, it's not about any of that. Everything we're doing is to shout the name of Jesus and to shine the light of the resurrection. That's what it's all about. It's not about us. It's not about religious activity, just putting a little check mark or another notch in your belt. Well, I went to church today. I hope I get some brownie points with God. God is not interested. God does not have a brownie point system. Or you can come into the house of God, and today, there's tears all over this stage. Because people got into the presence of God, and the light of God hit them. The power of the resurrection started to warm them up, and they melted on the inside, and it just leaked out of their eyes onto these steps today. But it depends on what you're made of. John chapter 1, verse number 5. You're there in the Gospel of John. John chapter 1 this time, really the genesis of the New Testament, if you will, talking about what took place in eternity past. John chapter 1 verse 5 says, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. What does that mean, did not comprehend it? It means that it could not overcome it. You ever been in a, in a dark room, maybe at your house you have a closet, and you could go inside and shut the door to that closet, and there is no natural light in there, right? There's nothing. It's completely pitch black. You could wave your hand in front of your face and not even see it. Anybody have a place like that? Okay, so you understand what I'm talking about. You get inside that closet, you shut the door. Now, you're there in darkness, and, and your eyes adjust, and after a little while, you know, you, you're, you're just there, right? Can't see your hand, nothing. What happens when you open the door? Does the darkness spill out of the closet? 
No, what happens? When you open that door, any light, natural or, or uh, incandescent, whatever you have, comes into the closet, right? Why? Because darkness cannot overcome light. Light overcomes the darkness. This past summer, my family, we went on vacation up into uh, Sequoia National Park. In the National Park, there is a cave that you can go into called Crystal Cave, really cool place. We took the tour, you know, and we're there, and our guide brought us into this massive cavern, right? It was just this huge, huge room. And, and we sat on this little wall, and I don't even know what was behind us, probably a drop. It seemed kind of scary. And we're sitting there with our children, and they said, now listen, we're going to shut all the lights off. Now, if you guys get scared, just let us know, okay? So we're kind of holding on to our children, making sure they don't fall off the divide there and go into who knows where. And uh, we're sitting there next to each other, and they turned those lights off. And my goodness, it was the craziest thing. Couldn't see nothing, couldn't hear nothing. You were just in black. I mean, it was nothing, nothing. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, kind of blink my eyes, wave my hand. Kids are waving their hands and all that kind of stuff. Couldn't see a thing, couldn't see a thing. Now, our guide said, I'm going to read you a short poem here in this darkness, and they clicked a little LED flashlight, just a little teeny tiny LED flashlight on so that they could read this little poem that they wanted to read to us there in the darkness. You know what happened when they clicked that little teeny tiny light on? The whole cavern became visible once again. See, it doesn't matter how much darkness there is out there. The resurrection light shines in that darkness and overcomes it every time. And you can warm up to that light. You can allow that to melt your heart. And you can allow it to change your life. You're there in John. Turn me to 1 John. 1 John, kind of towards the back of your Bible. 1 John, chapter number 1. 1 John, chapter number 1. If you hit the maps of Revelation, turn around, come back. You've gone too far. Thank you for those three laughs. I appreciate your support. You guys are awesome. Make them elders after the church services, okay? First John, chapter number one. See, light, when it's concentrated, can actually bring heat. So much so, in fact, that you can take a magnifying glass, concentrate that light, and you can start to burn leaves. And so anybody burn leaves as a kid or ants? Some of you guys are really bad. The little rascals burning ants on the anthill, right, with a magnifying glass. See, they've actually concentrated light so much so now that they can literally cut through things. They've got laser lights that they can cut out things with lasers. See, the light of God's presence is the same way. And some of you guys said, well, I came out of the darkness, and I came into the light, and, and, and I don't understand what's going on. It feels like there's more pressure, there's more heat here than there was over there. Of course there is, because God is doing something in your life. And God, with laser precision, may be getting something out of you. God might be melting something off of you. Maybe you're like the silver that's in the crucible right now, and the light of God's presence is burning away the dross and getting those things of the old nature out of you. But it's warming you up. It's taking away that coldness. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 7, look at what it says. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. See, if we can walk in the light as he is in the light, if we can bring those things out into the light, go and talk to God. Confess to him what's going on in your life. Tell him about the deep, dark secrets that are on the inside of you. And as you bring those things into the light, God says, the blood of Jesus, that blood that was sacrificed, the blood that was given for sin now, can cover those things in your life, and it can cleanse them. It can get them out of your life. He will take care of the issues of darkness inside of you and warm you up with his resurrection light. Can somebody please say amen? man. Last thing for today is this. Not only does the resurrection light bring clarity, not only does the resurrection light bring warmth, but the resurrection light brings life. There is no life on this planet without light. If you have a, a plant or something like that, you take it out of the light and you put it into the darkness. Doesn't matter how much water you give it, how many nutrients you put in the soil, doesn't matter what you do, you could sing songs to it if you want to. Listen, it was gonna die without the light. Hello? And we see this principle in Genesis chapter one. In fact, turn there with me. Some of you guys remember Genesis chapter number one when you started to, to read the Bible, right? You said, I'm gonna read the whole Bible. You're laughing because you did this. You started out in Genesis chapter one, verse number one. And you read through Genesis, did really good in Genesis, and then you got to Exodus, right? 
and you love the first part of Exodus, love the story, but you got kind of partway through Exodus, and all of a sudden, it was all this stuff about a tent that they were going to be building, and the types of woods, and the different type of things going on, and you just kind of were like, I just, you know what, I got to put this down. I'll come back to this later, right? And then later on, a couple of years down the road, you said, you know what? I'm going to read the whole Bible. This time I'm not playing, right? And so you went and you picked up the Bible. You started Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, and you got through Genesis, and then you said, I'm pushing through Exodus. I'm going to make it this time. And you pushed through Exodus, and then you hit Leviticus. You put it down. You never came back, right? <laughs> said, I'm done. That's it. I can't. Listen, if you're going to read the Bible... You can do that, you know, you can go through the whole thing, or why not start in the book of John in the New Testament? Find out about Jesus' life, then keep reading through Acts, right? Find out about the early church, then go through the epistles, the letters that were written to churches. That's where we live now. Okay, you hit Revelation. Revelation is a book about worship. It's a book about Jesus. It tells the cosmic scale. You may not understand everything. Just look for Jesus in there. It'll steer you right. And then start to dive into the Old Testament. Start to find out about the Psalms and the Proverbs and maybe the Kings and what happened in Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, all that kind of stuff. And then, then you can get into Leviticus. Just look for Jesus in Leviticus. You'll find him in there too, all right? Genesis chapter 1. You guys there? Did I talk long enough for you to find the first book of the Bible, first page, right? Okay, good, good. Genesis chapter one, verse number one. You guys should know this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse two, and the earth was without form and void. Now stop right there for a second. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the earth. That means that God already knew Jesus was gonna go to the cross, suffer and die, and be raised again on the third day before he ever created the earth. And everything, 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 everything in the Bible speaks and points to Jesus. Therefore, when we read Genesis chapter number one, it's pointing to Jesus. And I know you've read these verses, and I know you understand them as creation, but I want to show you something that maybe you haven't seen before in Genesis chapter one at the onset that's talking about what we're talking about today, that there is a light, that Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day and now shines that resurrection light. The earth was void and without form. Look at this. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3, then God said, let there be... Oh, that was weak. Let's try that again. Come on, this is an interactive sermon. You guys are going to help me preach the gospel today. And God said, let there be... Light. light. You, you did good. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was what? Good. good. See, that's been in our hearts since time began. That's why all these people writing stories about darkness versus light, right? The, they've got the, the castle of darkness, right? And the, the lava and all that kind of stuff. And here comes the hero riding on a white horse. It's always dark versus light. Why? Because God set it up that way in eternity. The darkness was there. Satan rebelled. Satan deceived. Satan took the authority. And yet God says, let there be light. And the light was, and the light was good, and the darkness did not overcome. It could not comprehend comprehend the light. Look at what it goes on to say, verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Verse 5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. Isn't that interesting? This is evening and morning. See, we think about a day as morning and evening, right? But here God says it was evening and then morning. The darkness was first, and then the light came along because God said, let there be light. Now, God was first, right? So God is number one. But then the darkness came, the evening. You know, you were born into sin. You were born into that darkness. And we all lived our lives in that darkness first. But then there came a time where the light of the gospel shined in our hearts and God spoke something into us. And the morning came to our lives. And the morning star Jesus rose and shined in our hearts. Some of you guys are in this place today and you haven't yet came into the light. And I want to show you the condition that some of us were in 